What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. From time to time, Pastor John will take a break from expositing a passage of scripture to do a time of questions and answers, typically on a Sunday evening at Grace Church. Often questions are presented directly by people in the congregation or are gathered by members of the staff, consolidated, and asked by one of the church's associate pastors. Today's broadcast is one of those instances where we're gonna jump into a conversation that took place on a Sunday night between Pastor John and college pastor Austin Duncan. So get comfy, grab your Bible, as they discuss the importance of shining a light in a dark culture. MacArthur. Yes. What's new? <laughs> uh, a lot. Um, You've been busy. I've seen you on TV lately. Yeah. I. Um... I, in a sense, I, I feel like um, it took me to get to 80 years before um, maybe the most critical moment in my life has taken place. And it's, uh, I think it's because there are more people listening to the Word of God at this particular time uh, from this pulpit than ever in the history of our church in a regular way, Sunday after Sunday, because of the uh, multiple dire conditions in our world, and uh, so, and there's a greater interest in hearing the Word of God. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's not just sort of inside the church, that it's outside many, many people wanting interviews, wanting me to write articles, and, uh, and even uh, putting these articles on basically secular um, websites and things like that, to, to hear from, from the Lord. I think about having the opportunity to write articles for these websites where I normally wouldn't, you know, be considered because I'm, I'm, I'm another generation or two removed at least, and I'm just biblical, and they're saying, give us more, give us more, give us more, because there's a hunger for this. And those of us who know you well know how much of an evangelist you are. And you've, you've always had that, that bent, uh, even as a young man preaching in the bus station uh, down in the south. You, you've always been evangelistic. The, the baptism here uh, is never still water. There's always people coming to Christ in this church. And you've also been an evangelist to the church. And so as we've watched these last weeks, and our church is full of hundreds of visitors uh, in the morning, and we're grateful that they're here, it's just very clear that you're mindful that there's, there's still a need for the gospel. Well, yeah, um, I, I've spent my whole life basically doing two things, trying to evangelize professing Christians so they become genuinely saved because we know the tares are mixed with the wheat, and secondly, trying to feed the, the true believers the Word of God so they can be sanctified. And I'm very much aware, of, as I'm preaching now and people are listening all over the, the world, and it's pretty remarkable, I think, within a, just a very brief time this morning, more people had downloaded that sermon on Facebook than anything that's ever come out of this pulpit in the past. And that's amazing. And that, what that means is that this is getting beyond where we normally reach. Um, so, and I always want to include in it the sinfulness of sin, the hopelessness of man without God, and the, the answer of the gospel and the forgiveness and salvation that Christ offers. So, yeah, there, there has to be that evangelistic emphasis all the time, and particularly now because we have people listening who don't just need to hear how the world should be, they need to hear how they can become right with God. So you talked about the wheat and the tares, and that's been a, a hallmark of your ministry is talking about the danger of a false believer, the, the lordship of Jesus. Mm -hmm. When we think about the consequences of 
Jesus's lordship in our lives. You're talking about eternity. And we're talking about the consequences of, of, of all that we're facing right now. What is the worst thing that can happen to us as a church? I mean, we go up against the county, we go to the Supreme Court potentially. I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen to us, MacArthur? Well, the worst thing that could happen to us would be to stop being the church. That's right. The worst thing that could happen to us would be not to be here and not to be proclaiming the Word of God, not to be living to the honor of Christ, not to be the shining light on the hill. We need to do this, and the world is looking at us. The entire world is, is looking at us. I can tell you that because um, I, I don't know how to do social media, but all the people who do uh, show me all the streams of things. And, you know, there, there's everything out there, um, good, bad, and indifferent, but the, the attention of the world is on us. And I think we're beginning to see other pastors be strengthened. Other pastors say, hey, we need to be the church. We, we, need to, we need to open the church. We need to not be afraid of this effort to terrify people. This is a massive effort to reset the entire global culture, including the United States of America. And the only way you can do that, it doesn't take an army to conquer a nation, it just takes fear. And it doesn't even have to be a real fear. It just has to be an artificial fear that people buy into. So this whole world and this culture is being manipulated in horrendous ways. Uh, out of fear, and um, the, the one thing that we cannot demonstrate is fear because we don't have anything to be afraid of. The worst thing that could happen to us is we all go to heaven, and that's the best thing that could happen to us. Shy of that, we've got nothing to fear. In the year 2000, a book came out with your name on it called Why Government Can't Save You. Mm -hmm. and alternative to political activism. Some people have been asking, MacArthur, has your view of the Christian's relationship to government changed since then? No. I take the same view of government that the prophets in the Old Testament took. I take the same view of, well, you heard my view of government today. You call the government to account when it steps out from under the conviction of the true and living God. I was serious when I said this morning, when I heard the, the presidential candidate, Democratic presidential candidate say if he gets elected, he's going, to fill, he's going to fill the White House with Muslims, I think he thought that was advancing this culture. But that is where we are, that there is no difference in the mind of leaders in this country between the true God and Satan. There's no difference. You can have God or you can have Satan. It really doesn't matter. Twenty years ago, you wrote these words in that book, rather than demanding our rights and creating for ourselves a world where we feel safe and accepted. We need to see the deep spiritual needs of the world and concern ourselves with offering people hope through Jesus Christ. That's what being a living sacrifice is mm -hmm. all about. Right. So that was in the era of the moral majority. And I had an issue with the moral majority because it doesn't matter if you go to hell moral or immoral. It only matters that you go to hell. That's right. It doesn't matter whether you go to hell as a policeman or a prostitute. It doesn't matter if you go to hell as a as a, an unconverted moral man or the most dissolute, immoral person on the planet, morality doesn't do anything. Uh, but if you, if you push morality, if you just push morality, 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 we've got to be moral, we've got to be moral, we want to create a moral country, you begin to, um, to develop a hostility toward the immoral people. And the problem with fighting for morality is all you end up with is Phariseeism. If you want to know what the moral majority looks like, go to the New Testament and look at the Pharisees. That's the moral majority. Lost on their way to hell, whited sepulchers, denounced by Jesus, completely moral and totally lost. So we're not for morality. That's what, what I was talking about this morning. I wasn't telling people to be moral. I was saying you better submit to God or you're going to be judged. It's a stand for righteousness. To stand for righteousness, justice, truth, honesty, uh, worshiping the true and living God. Yeah. In the meantime, we all live in a very pluralistic society. Our neighbors are Jewish and Muslim, and uh, we, we live in a world where there's going to be lots of different views of the world. So help us think about how we should relate to both the world around us, in light of what you said this morning, the, the accountability the whole world has, and how we relate to our government that's not uh, going to be a Christian government ever. 
Well, I, I, it's a God-ordained government. M marriage is a God-ordained institution. Um, government is a God-ordained institution, Romans 13. Um, and it's ordained for the well-being of man, the protection of those who do good, and the punishment of those who do evil. So you can have a functioning culture and a functioning society that can enjoy the benefits of common grace and uh, can allow God to be seen and manifest in the order of that society, much more so than in the chaos of a dysfunctional society. But where we have one simple job, the. The, the role that the church plays is to put on display the transforming power of Christ. What you heard in those testimonies tonight, um, transformed lives, just totally transformed lives. The church is that collection of transformed people, and uh, they're letting their light so shine before men that they may see their good works and glorify their Father who is in heaven, or as Paul says, let, you know, your light's in the world. Um, the, the, the church then is light, and we talked about that a few weeks ago, it's salt. It has a subtle influence of righteousness and it has an open declaration of truth and being light. But also the church is primarily called to proclaim the gospel. And that starts with focusing on the true God. So if I, if I would look at my responsibility to America, what I did this morning would be what I would call pre-evangelism. It's not actually going through the details of the gospel, but it's saying there's only one God, and He has revealed Himself in His Word, and you need to come to Him and worship Him and honor Him and obey Him, or you will be judged. Uh, you, you will forfeit blessing in this life, and you'll forfeit blessing forever in the life to come. So you start pre-evangelism by your definition of God. So we have to begin with sorting out the true and living God, which is what I was saying today, and calling nations to acknowledge the true and living God. I'm, I, I'm not asking America to go into dietary laws. They, they, were, they were basically set aside in the New Testament. We don't need to bring them back. Um, I'm not asking them to adhere to any of the sort of separational behaviors that God gave Israel to keep them separated from the pagans, those were all set, up, set aside. Uh, don't let anybody hold you to a new moon, a festival, a Sabbath, you know, any of those externals. And you don't even expect them to act like Christians. No, I don't. But I expect that if they're ever going to come to the knowledge of the true God, uh, whoever comes to God must believe that He is. Right Hebrew. So you have to start by believing in the right God. So what I'm trying to do at some point is go back to square one, and that was square one today. That's why you go to the Old Testament, right? The Old Testament has got two simple messages, and they basically were laid out by God in Deuteronomy. You're familiar with them, very familiar with them, 26 to 29, right? Yep. You, you come to God and you obey His Word and what? You're blessed. Yeah. You disobey God and what? Cursed. Cursed. That, that's, the, that's what the Old Testament is telling you from beginning to end. You obey God, you're blessed. You disobey God, you're cursed. That was, the, that, that was essentially the summation. I was going to go there this morning, but I ran out of time on that one. But, um, <laughs> but I'm trying to start where you have to start. He that cometh to God must believe that He is that He is the God He is and not some figment of somebody's imagination or some false God. So I, again, this morning I think was an epic journey where you brought all people and all nations under accountability and condemnation through the witness of the Scripture to the one true God mm -hmm. through His Son, Jesus Christ. There's no other way. You made that right. very clear. So in thinking about how individuals and nations need to respond to that and, and how individuals need to, need to respond to that, in light of all that's happening in our culture, and going back to that politics idea a little bit, there, there's maybe two extremes. People can make the idols that you talked about in this morning's message, they can make politics an idol and think that's the secret. If we can just get control, that was what you were warning about with the moral majority. And yeah, there's, they're there's not, those of us who they're are maybe not more our politically... enemy. They're not our enemy. They're our mission field. Right. So political idolatry 
over there on one side and then some kind of political maybe apathy or ambivalence is the way the Christian relates to government somewhere in the middle there? Um, well, I, I would say we only relate to government on one basis, and I said that this morning. Those that uphold the true God and His law, we affirm. Those that do not, we cannot affirm. It's that simple. So it, for us as Christians, it's, it's it's easier now than maybe it was 25 or 30 years ago to navigate the balance between uh, power and labor, um, which doesn't seem to be the issue today. It's, it's, it's all moral. And while we condemn the, the immorality and we support those who are moral and will uphold the law of the true and living God, we don't hate those people because they're not the enemy. They're God's enemy, but they're our mission field. And we're told to pray for them. And the assumption is to pray for their salvation. You, you were on a Skype call or Zoom call, whatever it is, this week with a bunch of pastors yeah. in the Master's Fellowship, and I was listening in on that, and, and you spoke to them about some of the questions they had in, in their churches. And so I, I wanted you to take a few minutes and talk to our church Tonight, there's still some folks who aren't with us yet. They're either not yeah. comfortable or they work in health care and they can't come into the crowd quite yet or they're immunocompromised. Can you be a healthy church member and, and be live streaming in this season? Do you want to say something sure. to those folks? Yeah, it's no different than any other year. It's no different than any other flu season. It's just, you know, you got to be careful if you have issues. And I understand that. I, we've never, I've never made an issue out of it. I, I think there's a lot more going on than the virus, for sure. Uh, as I've been saying, California rate of COVID is one one-hundredth of one percent. It's infinitesimal. We have the lowest death rate in the continental United States of any state from this, and it's a lot lower than the numbers indicate, and um, the average age of or the mean age of the people who die with, not from COVID, but die with it is, I think, 80. So we understand that older people... Um, and, and we like octogenarians around here. Thank you. Thank you. But I, but I don't, I don't want to tell people, look, I would tell anybody, if you don't feel well, you stay home. If you, if you feel like you have a compromised immune system and you don't want to expose yourself to something. But that, that's just normal, common sense life. You don't have to buy this fear that we're facing this unheard of death that's lingering around us. We've been, what, nine weeks at Grace Church? Um, you're here, you're not sick, and I, I, I don't know what else we can say. Uh, you don't have anything to fear, but anybody who's sensible and doesn't feel well, of course, and if you feel a little bit safer, you know, with a mask or something, that's, that's your choice to make. You, you might want to read a little more about that, but... Um, we, we, we're aware of how you feel about the mask. Well, <laughs> it's not so much how I feel about the mask, yeah. It's how I, I feel... much, but it's how I feel. questions their efficacy. No, it's, it's how I feel about the mask you've had in your pocket for three months. <laughs> this, one, this, one's, this one's six months old, actually. I don't think you take that one into surgery. If I, could. I also think my beard will kind of prevent its <laughs> effectiveness. But so let's, let's talk to people who are outside of our church and who, I mean, there's a lot of people in our culture who are genuinely afraid. Oh, yeah. That's the idea. And yeah, that's the idea. The, that, so I love Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15. That the reason Jesus became was to remove the fear right? of death. Yeah, to take us out from that slavery mm -hmm. that enslaved us all our lives, the fear mm -hmm. of death. Talk, talk to our people about talking to their culture about it's not that we're daredevils. That's not what's going on. We've always lived yeah. without a fear of death. Yeah, it reminds me of what Groucho Marx says. I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> um, and we, what, what is there to fear in death? Um, death, far better to depart and be with Christ. And I understand that that might be the perspective of somebody my age, not 
somebody a lot younger. But we understand even more than that. We understand that the years of our lives are determined by God. And um, that's all written in His book. Uh, he wrote down the number when we weren't even born, right? That's right. Uh, when we didn't even exist and we were being woven wonderfully in the womb, He numbered our days. So if somebody asked me the other day if, if I get mad, and I said, what would I get mad about? What, 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 what is there to be mad about? What? I, I'm, I'm blessed beyond comprehension. I'm going to heaven. I'm watching the providence and the power of God unfold. Uh, what's there, what's there to be mad about? Well, do you worry about things? What's there to worry about? What's there to fear? Uh, my years are predetermined, um, and they're in God's hands. And uh, there's perfect calm in, in my heart. Uh, I I don't have. I'm not concerned about what the courts might do or what you know punishment or whether somebody's going to haul me off to jail or whatever. Now that would just be the next adventure. Um, I, I had a friend years ago, Ralph Kuyper, and he had a little favorite thing he did when he would fly. He would get to the stewardess and he would say, what would happen if this plane crashed? <laughs> well, you, you, you don't normally say that on a flight to the stewardess. <laughs> but it was the way he introduced the gospel and he would... She, she would say, well, sir, I don't want to talk about that. Are you afraid of that? Well, isn't everybody? No. For you, there would be somebody to fear. For me, that would just be a novel way to get into heaven. <laughs> I mean, he did that in a kind of an offhanded, kind of humorous way. But yeah, just to understand that your life is already determined, if you're faithful, unless you go before your time because of sin. So just be faithful, be, be joyful, um, be sensible. You know, you don't want to walk into a contagious ward and be foolish. You don't want to lie down on the freeway and say, okay, God, it's not my time yet, so make sure they go around me. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think we should be joyful. And, you know, that's what people pick up when they come here is there's so much joy and Sunday mornings in this place. People are really amazed at that. It's not fear. There's just joy. It's uh, um, unbounded joy, and they see all these kids uh, all over the place and families, and there's just no fear. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, we know this thing isn't what they're telling us it is, and we also know that God's in control of all of our lives. And that's part of our testimony in this day and is why I'm telling pastors like on that call, open your church, have church. I don't think that the, the powers that be are going to let up on any of this until people finally say, we're not doing it anymore. We're just not going to do this. Yeah. I think businesses, it's just crushing what's happening to people who spent their whole life building a business. And until they say, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm going to open my store, I'm going to open my shop, I'm going back to business. Until people finally say, we've had it, we're not buying it anymore, and there's an overwhelming movement back this, they're going to keep the, the, the control because control is the ultimate head trip for somebody who wants power. Mac, I admire your faith, and I think that this season isn't different than other seasons because you're a, you're a black and white guy. You read the Bible, you believe the Bible, you respond to the Bible. And what I've seen in your life is, is you treat providence the same way when things happen in our world that seem so to us 2020 or unguessable or or erratic you have this the same demeanor you have towards scripture you see this is god's will mm -hmm. and it's something that i think is is so helpful for our church and for me personally as you lead us and you model that faithful response to both god's word and to providence so thank you pastor you're you're taking good care of us in these days thank you <laughs> Thank you. Mac, you got a final word? Well, um, I would just say, just maybe a good wrap-up point is, 
This is an incredible, incredible moment in the history of the church for you to be here. Don't you feel that way? I mean, this is amazing to be a part of this and to have the focus on us. I'm glad they're looking at a place that exalts the Word of God, that believes in God, has strong faith, mature believers, uh, a kind of fearless w willingness to stand in the will of God and take what comes, but do it with love. So I'm, I'm anxious to see this thing keep moving ahead so that we can protect the future right for churches to be the church in a dying culture. If ever this culture needed the true church, it's now. And the, the, the good part of it is it's going to filter out the, the weak and shallow churches, hopefully, which may be what the Lord has in mind, purging. Pastor, will you pray for us? Mm -hmm. Father, we do thank you for allowing us to leave the darkness and come to the light by your grace and your sovereign will. Thank you for bringing us to this place for such a time as this in history. Thank you for this blessed and beloved congregation of people and all those who recently have joined with us. Thank you for saving us sanctifying us, giving us the hope of eternal glory. Thank You for using us to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ in the world around us. Thank You for pouring out blessing on us so that people can see the transforming power of the gospel. Continue to protect us and use us for Your glory, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, here we are at another Thanksgiving season, and that is an important one for me and for the ministry of grace to you, because we have so very much to thank the Lord for, because He works through not only our ministry, but He works through those of you that support our ministry. We, we can produce a radio program, a television program, all the other resources, but we, we need the support of Christians who believe in this ministry, who love the Word of God, who love Christ, who believe in the Great Commission and believe that we're doing something to make that come to realization. So thank you for being a partner with us, and we thank the Lord for bringing you alongside as a close friend and team member. Just know we are grateful to you and uh, grateful to the Lord, and we trust that He will bless you in response to your faithfulness to grace to you. Thank you. The MacArthur Study Bible is a great gift for a new believer or a lifelong student of Scripture. Filled with Pastor John's personal study notes attached to virtually every verse, you'll find detailed information, explanations, and helpful insights as you strive to know God and His Word more. This invaluable resource is available by visiting our website, gty.org, or by calling our operators at 888-57-GRACE. While on the phone, we'd love to hear how the Lord is using grace to you to minister to you through the teaching of His Word. We'll see you next time as we continue to unleash God's truth one verse at a time.